because of that season, I've learned and developed things in my life that I do differently now. Specific routines that I do every morning since then that have helped me to stay winning, as I call it. I pray, I read, I meditate and journal every morning. Hey, everybody, what's up? Trey Wingo here. Welcome into another episode of Half Forgotten History. Our guest this week was so special and so unique. His nickname was Weapon X. I'm talking, of course, about safety, Brian Dawkins. Brian was the heart and soul of that Eagles defense for so long and then finished his career with a few good years with the Denver Broncos. And his Hall of Fame speech was one of the ones that surprised me the most. We touch on all of these things in this week's episode with Brian Dawkins. Please enjoy the conversation. So the first thing about you I've always admired was the intensity and the way you used to come on to the field, uh, you know, to get everybody excited, psyched up at the start of the game when you did the crawl. Recently, the Pro Football Hall of Fame put out a little video of you getting ready to walk out onto the stadium and you were just pacing back and forth like a bull ready to run out there. Where did that intensity come from? Where did you get that energy? That's me. That That's literally me. I've always been that, especially when it comes to sports. I was always the kid that would cry after a loss, right? I was probably the kid that um, coaches had to make me shake hands after we lose. I was that I was that cat, right? But learning how to channel it, you know, into a positive direction was one of the things that I've been blessed to learn over my life. And that's that's written in the book. And so that's me. That's, that's literally me. And it was not necessarily me doing things to pump other people up. Like, that's just me. Like, I'm... I'm full of energy. And one of the things that walking back and forth, I, I just trying to get rid of some of the energy. And sometimes I, I would literally yell because I can trying to get some of that energy out because it was like, like, like I was about to lose it. <laughs> how, how early did you know that you needed to be that hyped to play? It wasn't that I needed to be that hot hype to play. It was that I can be that hype and yeah. play. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it like, does. So some, it people, does. some people can't get to that type of level of, of hypeness, so to speak, and control it. And Jim Johnson put it beautifully as he described his defense. It was it was a controlled chaos is what it was. Like it was chaotic maybe to other people looking at me. But inside, I was clear on my job descriptions of what I needed to do. But I was full of energy, man. I, I couldn't I couldn't wait to do it. I couldn't wait to do it. Yeah, we'll get into Jim later because he was such a legendary coach in the NFL, longtime defensive coordinator with the Eagles, and had a real impact on your life. But I, I really want to take people through your journey because yeah. what you became in the NFL was not how you started in this game. Like when you started playing, they put you at center on the offensive line, right? And you you did not like that at all. Not even, not even a little bit. And the crazy <laughs> thing about that is I started off playing one year, the first year, excuse me, I started off playing quarterback and then I asked to move to, to running back because my line was struggling a little bit. So at least I can make somebody miss before they got to me. Um, but that next year, the coach that I was, I could have played for two coaches that first year. One coach was new. The one coach had been at the park for a long time. I chose to play for the new coach. And then the next year I had to play for the older coach. And I still to this day believe that he was mad at me for not playing that first year, choosing him. And he moved yeah. me to center. Like, But here, here's the thing about it. Because of the things that my dad taught me, and this is one of the powerful things, and this is also in the book. One of the powerful things my dad taught me is when you start something, you finish it. And not only do you finish it, you give everything that you have. No matter if you don't like the spot you're in, you go and you finish it and you stay coachable the whole time. And so that principle and how he taught me and and and, and showing them I'm supposed to be doing other things, though, I also learned that I'm going to give you more than is expected of me. So all of that was poured into this young kid at that time as a mindset. And I've taken that same formula and I've then applied it in my life. So to football, to, you know, to being an executive, whatever, being a whole, like when I was at ESPN, like all those things, I put that same formula into life. Yeah, you absolutely have. And and uh, listen, I, I feel like I need to tell this story now because we used to do this show at ESPN called Monday Morning Quarterback. And it was one of my favorite shows. We would just bounce around to all the coaches' press conferences and listen to what they had to say after a win or a loss. And we had you on one time. And I think the Eagles were getting set to play. They were getting set to play the Bears. And Devin Hester was 
uh, I think I think it was Hester. I can't remember who it was, but anyway, there was a great returner. And I asked you this question on the air, but this is, this is while you're still playing before you came and worked with us for a while. And I said, how scary is it to, you know, no, you got to try and stop that guy. I think it was Hester. might have been somebody else from trying or, may- or maybe it was uh, Dante Hall from trying to return a kick. And you looked at me through the lens like I was crazy. Oh, never scared. Never scared. But to, like you, you wanted to let. I mean, it was a bad question by me using that word, but you wanted to let everyone, we're never scared, we're prepared, but we're never, and I could feel the intensity coming through you when I asked that question. And and that's the thing about it. Like you, I have respect, don't get me wrong, yeah. too, that's the other thing. You have respect for the talent of another individual, but it's, there's never, you're never scared of that cat. Like, I'm going to yeah. do what I need to do. If I need to do other things, come up with other things. If we need to do things together as a team, form a wall, like we're never scared. We respect the heck out of you, but never yeah. scared. Never scared. Yeah. I never asked that question again, by the way, after after the stare down. <laughs> I got for you on a camera uh, somewhere else. So, you, you, like you said, you started playing center and your dad said, look, I don't care whether you hate it or not. You got to finish it. How hard was that to hear? How old were you when you when he said that? Man, I first my first year, I think I started playing football around it was 11, 11, 11 or 12 years old. So coming from where I was coming from and having a good time playing a game of football in the streets and just having a good time. And then the first year having a blast, you know, I led the team in tackles. I mean, excuse me, rushing and all those things. And then you go to center. Now, here's the other thing about it. I learned and developed not only to work harder, to show more, to give more than expected. I also developed a worker in myself to outwork those around me because I kept trying to show the coaches I'm supposed to be doing something else. So in conditioning drills, for instance, when conditioning at the end of practice, while everybody was tired and I'm tired too, right? I'm still running as hard as I can to once again, show them I'm supposed to be doing more. So in those tough times, I developed the mindset that I can even go further than all of my teammates because I want it more. Does this make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. So even- and so even from the, the the concept of playing a position that you don't want to play, right? I didn't do that for just one year. I did that for two doggone years. So yeah. because the next year I had to play for the same coach because he went up in age group. I had to go up with him, weight class and all that stuff. So I had to play for the same coach again. So I'm like, okay, so now they know I can run. I'm one of the fastest players on the team. I'm not that big. So I'm, I, I know he's going to put me in another position this year. Nope, center yep. for the second year. <laughs> and once again, I can't quit, quit. I have to be coachable and I have to give more than is expected of me. So what what I, what developed in me seriously though, I developed the thirst and a, uh, a understanding of how to lose use leverage, use my strength, use my speed and contact because it took it took me to um, a place of you talking about channeling aggression and, and whatnot. It reminds me of a, a water boy when mm. they helped him channel his anger. And you don't be talking yeah. about my mama, right? Don't you yeah. be talking about my mama. I love my mama very that, much. Yeah, I was talking. I was doing that same thing, similar thing, to those people in front of me. Because to me, yeah. that person was the coach who put yeah. me at center. And I'm finna, boy, I'm finna give it to you every dog on play. Because you that coach, and you get, yeah, I'm finna give it to you every play. So that I developed that mindset as well. This will be the only podcast ever we compare Adam Sandler to Brian Dawkins because that has never <laughs> happened in any other place anywhere in the world. By the way, this high school we're talking about is Reigns High School, which is also the high school that Harold Carmichael, longtime Eagles great and Hall of Famer, and Lito Shepard all went to. So who knew that Reigns High School is going to be the stepping stone to so many great Eagles players? Man, and then obviously you're talking about the Eagles there, but, you know, uh, Rod Gardner went there yep. as well, receiver back in the day. So, I mean, it, it Reigns has been a, a hotbed for talent for many years, but here it is. I don't, I, I don't even know if this – and I've, I, I've, I've quasi kind of sort of researched it, not to the lengths that others would do it, but for me and Harold to come out of the same high school – and both be Hall of Famers, and then both of us to play for the Philadelphia Eagles, the same pro team, like that doesn't exist, right? So it's something in the water, right? It, it got to be yeah. something in the water or something. All right, so you go through high school, and you, you it looked like you were on track to go play at Florida, but there were some academic issues, so you had to sort of regroup and refocus. So how did you get past that to get to where you wanted to go? Man, that that was a crushing blow to me. 
crushing blow to my ego and where I wanted to go, the things that I was set out to do. And Florida was really only, uh, it was only a handful of teams, a few teams that were recruiting me. And I was surprised that Florida was actually recruiting me. I was not a big time recruit back in those days. So when they took that scholarship away from me, here's what what it blessed me with. First of all, I was crying. It was a tearful moment. I was crying on my, sh my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife, Connie's shoulder now. And I knew I needed help because I could not do it by myself. So what I did is I reached out to my coach, Coach Black, who was my defensive back coach, but he was also um, uh, math. Um, I think he do, do the CamCat programs back in the day. I, I don't know what it's called now, but wood shop. And so he actually tutored me. And what he did with, to me and helped me with is to understand that I learn differently. And, yeah. you know, that was a absolute blessing for me to understand how I learned. See, I had been doing so many years of what teachers were telling me to do. And then everybody was doing the same thing. Like everybody learns the exact same way. And that is not the case. Obviously, I know more now. Didn't know it then. But when he showed me how I learn more visual, auditory, I need to listen to things as well bring up things almost in cartoon mode in order to grasp things. When he learned, when he taught me that, literally, I went from that student of struggling to a 4.0 student every nine weeks. Matter wow. of fact, I became a kid that would ask for more, more work to get my GPA up. But here's what that blessed me with. It blessed me that when I went to Clemson, I knew I can do it. I yeah. knew how to study. I developed study habits, right? So there was an absolute blessing in disguise. That's why I say it was, it was a blessing, blessed by the best, the book. That was one of those moments that was blessed and it blessed me the best so that I can develop the best version of myself at that time. Look, I, I love that. And I think those kind of stories are things that people need to hear because everyone sees, you know, whether I'm talking to the guy I went to high school with, Steve Young, or you, they, all they see is, oh, look, he's out here, he's excelling. They don't see the crap that you had to fight your way through. It reminds me of that old you know, picture of an iceberg. You see this much of the iceberg, you know, above and, the water. Most of it is below the water. And, and, and that's all the stuff that got you to where you are. And I, I think that's so impactful for people who think it's just this easy ride for these guys that are so blessed athletically. And, you know, you have all these things. There are so many things that you had to overcome. And I think it makes it so much more relatable to people. So many. And the one of the one of the main reasons for me actually giving the Hall of Fame speech the way that I gave it from my heart is literally people looking at me like that, like looking at me like, oh, you got it made, man. You've all of these things have been handed to you. You've always had success in your life. And I'm looking at them like if are you like you have no yeah. idea of the things yeah. that I've had to grow through, go through. Yes. But my mindset says now that I had to grow through those things to develop the character, to build my character up so that I can do it and excel. Pain has um, taken me to another level, like I said, in that Hall of Fame speech. So when you then when I then become more transparent, which which this book does is very transparent on some of the things that I've gone through in my life. Now they can hopefully see that, man. If he went through that, and that's similar to what I went through, man, that excuse that I have for myself to not push and persevere and go forward, mm, that excuse is no longer relevant. Yeah, it it, it no longer applies. I can no longer yeah. it, use it. It does not exist. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I want to get to, into a much more of the book a little bit later. But like you said, you, you went yeah. to Clemson. And to be clear, Clemson's a really good school and, you know, in, in a really good conference. But it wasn't the Clemson that we know now. You know what I mean? It no. wasn't like the Dabo Swinney were challenging Alabama every other year, except this year. You know, we're challenging right. Alabama right. almost right. every year. What was the Clemson experience like for you? And was there a moment? where you knew either in a practice or in a game, hey man, I might be able to make a living doing this. Man, when I got to when I got to Clemson, first of all, I just told you what I didn't tell you when we didn't talk about how I got to Clemson, right? So yeah. you saw it in book and you know that, right? How how I got to Clemson, right? So how I got to Clemson yeah. literally was short long story short for for the time's sake uh time's sake. My teammate Patrick Sapp, who was a quarterback at the time and he would have been like a five he would have been like a five-star athlete like pat was six four and he was literally 230 even back then playing quarterback running the option because he was a physical dude big dude that could run had a cannon for an arm so he was highly recruited in order to play the quarterback position but a lot of teams wanted him to move the tight end because of the color of his skin to be honest with you but clemson was one of those individuals one of those teams excuse me that wanted him and they wanted him so bad that Pat basically told them that if I come to Clemson, Doc has to come with me. That's how wow. I got to Clemson. 
Didn't know that then. I thought yeah. that they wanted me, right? Nope, they wanted right. Pat so bad that they was willing to take a chance on me. And so now that I look back on it, I recognize that, yes, I was literally treated. I can feel and sense that I necessarily was not necessarily wanted. That's just me, right? You can feel, you can feel. I was 5'10", 5'11", maybe, 180, excuse me, 175 pounds when I got there. The other two safeties in my class, both of those guys were 6'1", six, one six, one and 6'2". One of them was 215 and the other was two, uh, 220. That's what they like as safety. So have me there playing safety, that was not the thing that they wanted. So long story short, once again, that first year was brutal. I, I, I was literally not only homesick, like I, I literally wanted to go back home. That's, that's how bad that I felt there. I, I did not feel, feel welcome there. But once again, what did my dad teach me? Yeah, don't go quit. Home. You yeah. don't quit. And you give everything that you got and you stay coachable. So I developed that mindset. And so the first thing that I did is I, I, de I developed the mindset that whatever you put me in, I'm going to be the best at it. So I was basically a special teams demon is what they call me. So that first year, my, my freshman year, I won basically every special teams award that there is because that was my mindset. You put me in this, I'm going to be the absolute best at it. That is what allowed me to then go to the next level in the coach's mind that they made room for me that next year. Once I got a chance to be on the field in some of the last games because the strong safety got hurt, I was able to perform at a high level. And then that they made way for me. So they moved him to linebacker to get me on the field at strong safety. I knew after that second year, though, my sophomore year, I knew I had a chance. I didn't know where I was going to go in the draft, but I knew I had a chance. Of, of, of because of the way that I was um, blessed to perform at that early age. Yeah, well, listen, you absolutely had a chance. You were drafted in the second round by the uh, Eagles in the 1996 draft, 61st overall. Why don't we take a break here? When we come back with Brian Dawkins on this episode of Half Forgotten History, we'll talk about the next uh, level of his career and how he became one of the most beloved Philadelphia Eagles of all time. Back with Brian Dawkins right after this. Well, coming off the NBA's All-Star Weekend, there are five teams in the league that are better than 10-1 to 1 at Caesar Sportsbook to win the NBA championship. The Suns, who of course have the best record in the league at 48-10, are the favorites at plus 450 to win their first NBA title after being defeated by the Bucks in the finals a year ago. Right behind Phoenix is Golden State at plus 475. As we know, the Warriors, with all their injuries and other problems, have missed the postseason each of the past two years. But remember, they went to five straight finals before that winning it three times. The Nets and Bucks are both a plus 600 to hold the Larry O'Brien Trophy. The Nets, as you know, have never won an NBA title, but they won a couple of ABA titles before the merger. And the 76ers are plus 650 to claim their first title since that great 82-83 campaign. Find more of Trace Trends at Caesar Sports on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube. Twenty-one-year-older, eighteen-year-older in D.C. must be physically present in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Washington D.C. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Ohio, and Utah, and other states where prohibited. Know when to stop before you start. Gambling problem in Illinois, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, crisis counseling and referral services can be accessed by calling 1-800-GAMBLER, that's 1-800-426-2537, or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. Colorado, D.C., Nevada, call 1-800-522-4700. Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Iowa, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. Louisiana, call 1-877-770-STOP. In Michigan, call 1-800-270-7117. Tennessee, call or text TN Redline at 1-800-889-9789. Virginia, call 1-888-532-3500. Copyright 2002, Caesars Entertainment. Gambling problem in New York? Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text hope new york 467369 all right, back with Brian Dawkins on this episode of Half Forgotten History. Such a fascinating story and a fascinating career. You get to Philadelphia in 1996, and you went through some coaches uh, in Philadelphia. I mean, you know, there were, a, there were a lot of different guys that you played for early on before Andy Reid sort of became the, the standard bearer there. How would you describe your first couple of years in Philadelphia? 
with all of that um, flux, I guess you can call it, the, the stability yeah. was Emmett Thomas. Yep. The stability was Emmett Thomas, and he was Uncle E for me, right? Him, having him, and I, I, and, I, and I said this, and I will continue to say this, that without Emmett, I don't know, first of all, if I would still be here, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't know if I would have developed the mindset that I had when Jim Johnson got there. Because Jim Emmett was so hard on me, and he was so it was such a in a loving way he was chewing me out in a loving way. I knew he cared about me, and so but he saw a vision of me. He Ray and um, actually he Ray and uh, Mr. John Wooten, you know they they saw a vision. Ray, for those people that don't know Ray Rhodes, who was the yes, was the Ray head coach Rhodes. there when you got there, yeah, yes, and so they saw a vision of me, and I did not see that vision for myself. I was just trying to make the dog on team. Like the, for the first couple of years, to be honest with you, I thought you know I thought I could get cut at any time. I thought that I could after in training camp I can walk to my locker and I would have a note, bring your playbook to the to the to the grim grim reaper, reaper as they called him. So that I was all I had that always in my mind that I can get cut at every time, any time. But they had a vision of me of the significance and the way that I can play the game at the level that I was blessed to then go and play it. And I had to believe in Emmett's vision of me until I can develop a vision for myself because I did not have one. So that's what Emmett also blessed me with. He blessed me with the understanding and the vision that I had a significant level of talent, way more than I was was showing at that moment. So that is what propelled me to that. So with all the flux you're talking about, that, that stability for that time uh, frame with Emmett blessed the heck out of me, man. I'm telling you, yeah. blessed the heck out of me. I mean, you came to the Eagles at a really interesting time because that was the sort of the tail end of the Cowboys dynasty of the 90s, right? Uh, they had won their third Super Bowl in four years in 95. You come in in 96. Your first sack of your career was Hall of Famer Troy Aikman. That that had to be a, a pretty cool moment, right? <laughs> Absolutely. My thing, I, th I believe it was a Monday night game too. Yeah. Sack. Yeah. Paul's fumble, Red Hall picked it off in the midair, took it to the house for seven. Like, oh my goodness, you could have, you couldn't have told me that I was wasn't uh, made for the NFL after that. Real talk, like seriously, Cowboys yeah. doing that Monday Night Football. Oh yeah, I belong in this. Yeah. I belong in this. <laughs> and, and that sort of became the transition part from the Eagles being the second class citizens behind the Cowboys to you guys essentially owning that division for a while. I mean, the, the NFC East yeah. now is crazy. Nobody's repeated as division champs since you guys did it four years in a row uh, starting in 1999. So what was it like going from the team that wasn't good enough in that division to being the kings of the division? Man, but even but to get to that point, though, we yeah. had to go through some stuff. Yeah. So that Ray leaving, us earning the right, and I say it like this, purposefully us earning the right to draft Donovan number two <laughs> in the yeah. draft. You earn those high draft picks. You earn them. Yes. Right. We earn the heck out of them. Right. But here's the thing. Here's what happened um, as a team, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Like we jail so much during that tough time. Like those tough times, it was literally like a bonding experience, right? So bonding at old school wood shop, right? You metal, you put that heat on it, boom, that bond happened, and it's a lot stronger than than any other parts of the of the metal. Yet yeah, that's what happened during that during those tough times. Cause we we were playing for one another, we were going all out for one another, and we didn't stop until the to the double zeros on the on the board. Now that's the that's the mindset that Andy Reid got. When I when they came in with with Jim Johnson and his defense, we had been I guess baptized by the fire, and so he got a team literally that was willing to go through a brick wall for one another first of all, and then if you show us that we can respect you and you can we can believe in you as your the coaching style that you're bringing back to us, we're going to go through that brick wall for you as well. So that's what they got. That's what we then went on to do. And so to your point, to have the success that we had. Soon after that, when Andy got here, doing what they were doing, and then we went on to, and I always tell people this, and it's not, it's not a slight on Dallas. It really is not. I'm not. They weren't my rival. Like, my record against da Dallas, me playing them, like, man, it was more like six, 17 to like six or seven losses. Like, yeah, yeah. that's not a rival. My rival was the Giants. I love playing against them dudes. Like, that was yeah. my rival. So, to your point, 
having that success and flipping things around um, and being the the team that was, uh, I love it, the hated team because we were winning yeah. so much. I love that. I love that. Tell me a little bit about Andy because like, I, I don't think that he gets the credit he deserves as a head coach because anybody that goes in the head coaching era of Bill Belichick is always going to look that diminished. But he's the only coach in NFL history to have at least 100 wins with two franchises, the Chiefs, and of course, when he was with you guys. He's been to three Super Bowls. He's won one. When someone asks you, what is Andy Reid as a head coach, what would you say? Andy is a, uh, he's a leader of men, first of all. Uh, I really do believe that. He's a leader of men. And one of the things that I consider to be a leader of men is when you empower someone to do what you've given them the, 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 the title to do. For instance, yeah. Jim Johnson. Who did he hire when he first got there? He hired Jim Johnson. And he hired John Harbaugh to be his special teams coaches. You Do you think that he had to be in their rooms talking to them about defense and special teams a whole lot? No. Nope. He empowered them to do what it is they needed to do. Here's the other thing that Andy has done, and I'm pretty sure he does the same thing in Kansas City. He empowers us as leaders who've earned the right to lead, to lead in the locker room. So it's not a whole lot that they had to do coaches-wise in the locker room. That's our responsibility. The only thing that they need to possibly do is X's and O's because we were handling things and doing what we need to do in the locker room, holding one another accountable to a high degree so that they don't have to worry about those things. And then also, to, he, he would always talk about the being yourself. Like, let, let your, let your um, how do he say it? Let your, um, not your attitude, but your, ah, I forgot how he said it. But basically, it's be you. Don't be anything other than yourself. Let your enthusiasm loose. Like, absolutely let it all roll. For me, let it all roll? Yeah, that means I'm crawling out the tunnel, right? That means I'm acting <laughs> a fool on the field, right? Yeah. So absolute, that was an absolute like blessing for me that you don't have this coach t- trying to tell me to calm down. It doesn't take all of that. You know, be under control. He was like, no, let your, let your personality, that's what he said, let your personality show. And I'm like, oh my goodness, uh, do you really want me to do that? Oh, it's uh, you all, sure? It's you sure? All, you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. But no, seriously, that's that's what he's done. And look, look in Kansas City now. Like, who's the yeah. offensive coordinator? You know, Eric um, Bieniemy. Eric Bieniemy, right? Yeah. My former defensive back coach is is the defensive coordinator, right? And so yeah. I think Tobe is is uh, the um, special teams coach, right? So he has quality dudes that he doesn't have to worry about all of these other things. He can just handle some of the small uh, small details, which he was he used to always preach about. If you handle the small details, the big things will take care of themselves. You know, obviously the link is a great place for the Eagles to play now, and it's a great stadium. But the Eagles, to me, will always be defined by playing at the vet. I mean, the vet was just – and you guys shut it down that one year. Um, what what was it like? I mean, I think legitimately for – variety of reasons the Eagles defense being one of them but then the surface I mean that what you you knew you were you were in for a whole world of pain when you came in to play the Eagles at, at, at old veteran in, stadium in so many ways Jack in so many ways not only the surface not only the team you're about to play you're gonna you're gonna be a, in for a hurt with your ears because the fans are gonna let you have it with you know not so pleasant words coming from the stands right so like the whole atmosphere was literally it was literally you know, like Russell Crowe, you know, just gladiator, right? So that's how I felt going into that, going to that arena when it's time for game day. You're thinking about the pain that you're about to inflict on this other team, right? And so the issue with the turf, like we didn't, I mean, don't get me wrong. We we hated it as, as well, sure. right? But there's nothing that you can do about that. All you can do is go out and, and play on the surface that is provided for you. And we're not thinking about those things. We know what to do, where, where to kind of stay away from a little bit on the field. But the intensity in that stadium, man, the, the wow, it, it was literally, like I said, that gladiator feel to it. Literally. Yeah, it was absolutely insane. I always felt like you guys had some sort of mental edge just because everybody else was thinking about the turf going into that game. And you guys weren't thinking about it because, like, look, it is what it is. We play on this every it week. Is. Yeah, it is what it yeah. is. What kind of what shoes do we wear and, and all of those things? Nope. We don't worry about yeah. that. Just go ball. Yeah. So the culmination of your time in Philadelphia obviously was getting to Super Bowl 39. And that was a really interesting, weird, on a lot of levels, uh, years for the Eagles. Terrell Owens comes over, and we had T.O. on the podcast earlier. And, you know, obviously there were a lot of ups, 
and a lot of downs and a lot of fights and a lot of spats. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But you guys figured out without Tio because he broke his leg on that Roy Williams horse tackle collar. You guys make it to the Super Bowl in your hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, going up against the Patriots. A- and you had to be thinking going into Super Bowl 39, this was meant to be for me, right? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. First of all, I mean, I love Jacksonville. I, I, I didn't necessarily want to play back home. Like, I know Jacksonville. I wanted to go somewhere else. I want to go Miami or, you know, out out with the Chargers, L.A., something like that, right? But being able to then play it in your backyard, absolutely. You're thinking that th- this is going to be it. This is the one. But even before then, like that whole year, like this, this is what we're going to do. It, that year was literally me thinking, I can't speak for my teammates, but me believing and in, in, in thinking is not that we're going to beat you is how much we're going to beat you by and how quickly the starters are going to sit out in the fourth quarter. That's how we were handling. That's how quickly we were handling business pretty much the whole year. Like the last couple of games, you know, um, the Steelers let us have it, you know, to to, uh, to, to take away the uh, give us that one loss. And then Andy said a lot of guys, you know, soon after we clinched everything. So those last couple of losses, you know, we, we didn't we didn't really play our starters. So we knew what we were going to do that year. We knew we were going to be in the Super Bowl. And when we lost, even when we lost Donovan, not Donovan, um, T.O., we had been to that place so many times. We knew how to get to the doggone chip playoffs. We knew how to handle business all the way up into the NFC Championship game, right? And it, it just felt, whatever for reason that year, it just felt that, like, we're going to do what we need to do. You're coming back into the the city of brotherly love. It's going to be freezing. And then my whole thing was I felt we were being disrespected as a defense. That whole week, it was always about Atlanta's defense. So I'm hearing disrespect. I'm spreading disrespect to my teammates. And we're like, yeah, we're going to show what, we're going to show them what's going on. And so to finally get over that hump to get into the Super Bowl, man, that's why that celebration after that NFC Championship game will be one that I, that'll be the game that I will remember forever. Because we was like, we finally, we, we finally got over that doggone hump. I remember, you know, even Andy and and Jim, you know, tears of joy. Like we finally, Doc, we finally did it. We found. I will always remember that. Always remember yeah. that. So you get to the Super Bowl, and it, it's really a close game all the way. It ends up being a three point game, twenty four twenty one. A lot of discussion still to this day is about that final drive where you're trying to get in the hurry up situation, and you know Donovan's sort of puking in the huddle. And what were you was going through your mind as you're watching from the sidelines as them trying to get down there and try and score those points. So it wasn't just the last drive. It was like yeah. the last two, three drives, right? There was the urgency. Like you were looking at the clock. I'm looking at them, looking at the clock, looking at them, looking at the clock, looking at them. I'm like, uh, yeah, maybe they we know need something to move. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, like, maybe they know something I don't know. But, yeah, okay, we might need to, like, speed this up. <laughs> but yeah. the, the thing that I always remember, though, is we gave up that last field goal, and we lost by three. We allowed them to drive the ball the length of the field to kick a field goal. Um, on that last, on that opportunity. And that was really the game clinching field goal. So as much as people want to heap it on Donovan and heap it on everybody else, to me as a defense in the, in those, uh, the last four minutes of the game, the details in those last four minutes, you have to hold up your end of the bargain. And we gave up a long clock eating drive and gave up that field goal. Yeah. And so that, in that game, T.O. came back from the broken leg and had an amazing game. Um, but it was really the next year where the whole T.O. Donovan thing exploded. That was insane. And that led to the parking lot workout, you know, with him. Where he was sent away <laughs> from training camp. Like, what what was going through your mind when all of that was going on during training camp? I mean, did you see the fight? Because that fight is now something that lives in infamy. You know, the whole throwdown with a couple of people there defending Donovan and all that kind of stuff. What are your recollections of everything that happened then? Man, it was it was literally a circus in, in, in a lot of aspects, especially the, you know, he T.O.'s out there doing sit ups and his doggone push ups in the driveway. And we're sitting there in the um, in training camp and everybody's huddled around looking at the TV laughing like, I you look at this. Are you serious? Look at this dude. <laughs> and the thing about for me and, 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 and you probably have had a, a similar experience. If not, I'll tell you my experience with T.O. Like T.O. is like T.O. has a big heart. Like when you really sit down and talk and you really listen to him and some of the other things, his ideas and, and, and um, like he's a different cat when you have that conversation. And sometimes that we get in front of the camera, you're like, man, why would you say that? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Why would you say that? T? Why would you say that? So I was always um, 
I was always leaning toward the dude that I would have conversations with one-on-one, right? And so he brought a, a toughness to our offense that was lacking, especially in the receiver room, a work ethic that was uh, lacking, to be honest with you. Um, and he brought other things with him as far as technology, some of the things that he did from a workout perspective, hyperbaric chambers. I bought one because of him, right? So he added a whole lot in that way. But then there's the other part of it. Yeah. And it, it, it really literally boiled down to two cats not being not really, really willing to sit down and work out some differences. Like that's what it all came down to. Like sometimes you have to give a little bit more. Sometimes you have to um, humble yourself a little bit more to for the benefit of everybody. Right. Because I, I can only imagine if they worked that out, if they handled whatever business and however physical that got it got. Right. Had they been able to handle that and just deal with that? How many at, we, we won it? We win at least one Super Bowl. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go up and say other Super Bowls, but we, we win at least one. And they set the record, I think, for touchdowns by the Eagles in one year. So imagine you get that chemistry going, going forward, how many other things that would have happened. So it's a shame that it happened the way that it happened, but it is what it is. It, look, it, it made for one of the most fascinating things of my entire career covering the NFL. That that whole dynamic was absolutely crazy, but it just proves like you can have talent, but you have to have everybody on the same page, right? Like that's the thing that I love about football more than anything else. Like at that point, no one was better than T.O. And Don was one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Your defense was great. You had a bunch of weapons that you could work with. Even Freddie Mitchell. We'll give Freddie Mitchell some love here in, in all of this. But, you know, it just proves that that little thing that we call chemistry, it really matters. People try and pretend like it doesn't, but it really matters. It matters. That's why when you have you go all the way back to Washington when they when they got the team together, right? They was bringing all the veterans from all other teams and they put them together. I'm like, just because you have talent on the team, if you don't have chemistry, that does nothing. When you have all that talent, sometimes you're gonna have people who were here that have to come down just a little bit, right? You have to bring yourself down a little bit to allow somebody else to shine. Like for me, I mean, I don't care. Shine. Lido, shine, yeah. brother. Like uh, Mike Lewis, shine. Troy, shine, right? Because if you shine, and that means we winning, right? I'm going to get, I'm, listen, I'm going to get mine. I'm going to do what I need to do to get mine. So, but, but when those times I need to sit back and listen, yeah, I'm listening. Like I don't always have to be the guy. So that's, that's, that's the thing about it is when you get all those cooks in the kitchen sometimes, um, it's really hard to have a cohesive unit because when you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen, people begin to eat the cooking of different cooks, right? <laughs> yeah. And if everybody's, if you got five different cooks yeah. cooking different things, now nobody's rowing in the same direction. So everybody's rowing in different directions and there's no way you have success. There's no way you gain momentum. There's no way you bond. None of that stuff happens if you're not rowing in the same direction. Well, listen, that, that's why I think football is the ultimate team sport, because you have to have everybody on the same page. If one guy's off script, uh, more often than not, you are dead in the water. But one of the things that I, I really like about watching guys that I covered is seeing them have success outside of football, because so many people are wrapped up into what they do when they play football. And when that's over, a lot of people have a hard time redefining themselves. You have done an amazing uh, job in your post NFL career. Why don't we take our second break here? When we come back with Brian Dawkins, we'll talk about his very candid book, his very candid Hall of Fame speech, and the things he's doing now. Stay with us. Half Forgotten History with Brian Dawkins right after this. Well, coming off the NBA's All Star Weekend, there are five teams in the league that are better than 10 to 1 at Caesar Sportsbook to win the NBA championship. The Suns, who of course have the best record in the league at 48 and 10, are the favorites at plus 450 to win their first NBA title after being defeated by the Bucks in the finals a year ago. Right behind Phoenix is Golden State at plus 475. As we know, the Warriors, with all their injuries and other problems, have missed the postseason each of the past two years. But remember, they went to five straight finals before that, winning it three times. The Nets and Bucks are both a plus 600 to hold the Larry O'Brien Trophy. The Nets, as you know, have never won an NBA title, but they won a couple of ABA titles before the merger. And the 76ers are plus 650 to claim their first title since that great 82-83 campaign. Find more of Trace Trends at Caesar Sports on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube. Mm-hmm. 
21 or older, 18 or older in D.C. must be physically present in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Washington, D.C. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Ohio, and Utah, and other states where prohibited. Know when to stop before you start. Gambling problem in Illinois, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, crisis canceling and referral services can be accessed by calling 1-800-GAMBLER, that's 1-800-426-2537, or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. Colorado, D.C., Nevada, call 1-800-522-4700. Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Iowa, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. Louisiana, call 1-877-770-STOP. In Michigan, call 1-800-270-7117. Tennessee, call or text TN Redline at 1-800-889-9789. Virginia, call 1-888-532-3500. Copyright 2002, Caesars Entertainment. Gambling problem in New York? Call 1-877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text HOPE NEW YORK 467369. All right, back with Brian Dawkins, who I got a chance to work with for a little bit uh, on NFL Live when he came and worked with us at ESPN. It was it was a lot of fun. But, you know, then you went on to do a million different things. You were an executive uh, in the front office with the Eagles for a while. You, you, you resigned from that to do your own thing, and you've, you've done great. But when you got into the Hall of Fame, I think a lot of people were shocked by how candid and open you were about the mental health issues that you had struggled with throughout your career because – None of us had really seen that or, or heard of it. And I was really moved by how how you wanted to share that with everybody at that time to show people how important it was for them to understand that. That was something I prayed about heavily about, first of all, what to speak about, right? And I had so many fans coming up, and, and I said a little earlier, that it was almost as if that all of these things have been handed to me. Like I've, you've never gone through anything. You're you're always winning in life. You've always been the guy, so to speak. And I'm like, no, that is far from the truth. So I prayed about, you know, what what can I share about my journey to help those who may be going through similar things? And so that's where the, the literally the Holy Spirit just gave me, you know, the um, the okay, basically to be to to kind of give a testimony, like to show people and tell people where I came from. Yes, the people that have blessed me along the way, because I did not reach that level, Hall of Fame, that bus by myself. You know, I did not do it. But also here, here are the things that I did have to grow through, that I went through and have grown through. And one of them was going through a, a mental, I call it cerebral wellness, but mental health, right? I've had to deal with some things in my life when it per, as it pertains to that. But the thing that I really wanted to emphasize is that like there is something on the other side of that. Yeah. You you talked in that speech about potentially taking your life. Yes. And that's how dark and how deep it went for me. And I wanted to be real with that. That's why I was really blunt with the way that I said the things. I, I It wasn't a maybe a pro- politically correct way to say what I said, but I really wanted to be blunt of where I was at that moment in, in my life. But also to let you know that that moment That moment in time or that moment in where I was, was literally for just a season for everything. There is just a season. So that was a season in my life. And because of that season, I've learned and developed things in my life that I do differently now. Specific routines that I do every morning since then that have helped me to stay winning, as I call it. I pray, I read, I meditate and journal every morning. And that came from growing through that time in my life. Now, here's the thing about me. I believe when I learn something, I gain an understanding of how to live life on my terms, how to live life in a vibrant way, how to actually live life and not just try to survive, but to thrive. When I learn that, I'm supposed to give that away. I'm not supposed to keep that to myself. I'm supposed to share that with other people. So here we here I, here I am on stage at the Hall of Fame, giving my Hall of Fame speech in front of millions of millions of people that are going to see this. That's my opportunity to share that wisdom with someone. Don't know who it was going to be, but I've received I've received thousands of DMs by men, really, of, of telling me how that moment 
that moment, that speech, basically it touched them. Yes, they were crying. And I told them I was, I was crying too. I just didn't cry on stage. I had to hold it together. But I, after this, after what, yeah, I was crying as well, but it, it, it prevented them from doing what they were planning. And then they went on to ask and get help. And that's what it was for. That's what it was for. Were you nervous about that? Were you, what, what were your expectations of how that would, would be received? It was game day. It was game day. So that pacing back and forth you was talking about before the speech is the same way that I was before games because I was prayed up. I knew the game plan and I knew I was about to dominate on the field. Now it was different. I wasn't on the field anymore, but I knew I was going to do some dominating on the stage in my speech. But instead of me hitting you physically, I was about to be hitting you with some of these words. And I can, and when I hit you physically, I move you. But with the words that I was about to spit, that I believe I was going to be hitting someone and they were going to be moved by it and not just move emotionally, but move to get your butt up out the seat, grab your phone and call the person that you need to call to get the help that you need to have. Because that is what that speech literally was for, to thank those who have blessed me. Yes, but to also help those who are going through and feel that they're stuck in whatever it is that they're in. And it was my job at that moment and my, and, what I believe was to share my story, the totality of it, you know, but to share my story to once again, help someone to get up out of that stinking thinking spot and get out of the quiet, deadly spot of not sharing what you have going on in you. Like I always say that yes, our silence is literally, is, is literally, literally killing us. Literally. How, how rewarding for you has been the reaction to so many people? Wow. From what you said. Trey, you have no idea how many times um, it's men older than me. Like, I'm blessed to be 48 now. I mean, you have men in their 60s and sometimes in their 60s and 70s, and they'll see me. And they'll recognize who I am, and they'll make their, I can see them beating and coming to me, and they'll just, as they're shaking my hand, they're trembling with eye, like crying about what my speech helped them bring out bring up and bring out to share, to get out of them. And so it's a humbling place. Cause I know it, when it's all said and done, yes, it's me, but uh, you know, my, I'm, I'm a vertical relationship guy. So right. I, I know that that was the Lord blessing me to speak in the terms that I spoke in order to bless those with things that they needed to hear at that moment. But to have, once again, these are grown men, like gristle grown men, man, coming up yeah. to me and like just tears, man. And, and oftentimes, People will stop in front of me and we would be chatting. I've never, never met them before, but because of that and because of the book and me being open with, with, with me, like I'm very upfront with who I am, my emotions and, and whatnot, people feel led to, to share some things with me. So yeah, I've prayed with a lot of people through some of the things that they're, they're going through in their lives. It, it was a remarkable speech, one, one I'll never forget. And, and I'm sure that's going to be part of the book. Tell us more about the book. And what what made you want to write the book now? And what message do you want people to get from the book? Yeah, so so the book was that. So as I was an executive, as you mentioned, and blessed to be behind the scene, you know, helping, um, helping the culture, build the culture there in, in the building, not just on the team, but in the building. Um, and we won the Super Bowl, right? So boom, celebration. We're on, I'm on the, the float and we're riding. But at that moment, my heart is changing. The same level, level of passion and drive and grit and determination that I put into the game, I put then into the job that I was doing at the time, blessing the building, blessing the players and, and, and whatnot. That drive, determination began to change. I no longer had it to the d degree and the voice in my head that was constantly telling me to move on to the next thing was telling me, you know, you're supposed to be doing more. You know, you're supposed to be doing more. And the more was I couldn't do what I'm doing right now in the building. If I'm an employee of the Eagles, I can't I can't be doing what I'm doing right now. It's writing my book, going on tours, talking, helping people, inspiring people. Right. I, I can't do that. So the love and the passion, I, I now have that to then pour into as many people as possible outside of the building. Yes, still in the building if I can, but outside of the building. So that's where this has taken me to Brian Dawkins, starting the Brian Dawkins Impact Foundation, um, utilizing my inspiration and motivational abilities, being more like a life coach, 
uh, mindset coach for individuals. I have a program coming out called the Beast the uh, the Beast Program. Um, it's the Weapon X Academy that's going to be coming out coaching, and so those are some of the things that I'll be doing. You know, helping people develop their beast inside of them. And the beast is an acronym. It stands for the best energy attitude self today. That's the acronym. And so it is my pleasure to help people develop that beast, the best version of themselves in whatever situation that they find themselves in. But that's where I'm now headed. I could, again, I couldn't do that in the building. I couldn't do that in the building. Well, listen, you were a beast when you when you played, and now you're helping people find their inner beast, which is really cool. And uh, I've always enjoyed our interactions. I, I loved our time together when we worked at ESPN, and I really appreciate you taking time out of what is a very busy schedule for you to be a part of, uh, of the show today. Doc, it's always good to talk to you, my man, and uh, always you, continued brother. blessings, all right? Thank you, brother. Thank you. So thanks once again to Brian Dawkins. His intensity as a player was incredible. His speech at the Hall of Fame really opened a lot of eyes and hopefully it helped some people who might have been going through the same things that Brian Dawkins was going through. Next week's guest is hard to quantify because he was primarily a special teams player. And I don't mean a returner, I mean a special teams player, a gunner on kickoffs, blocks, punts, did all those things, made sure that the return guy went nowhere. He might have been the best to ever do it. Long time wide receiver, but really a special teams maven for the Buffalo Bills, Steve Tasker. That's next week on Half Forgotten History. We'll see you then.